So my name is Keith Williams. I'm the executive director of the North, Edu North Bay Education Foundation. That's a, primarily a residential program that's based on the, on the tippy top of the Chesapeake Bay, right where the Susquehanna comes into the Chesapeake. But we work nationwide. We work heavily in the mid-Atlantic. Um, you know, there's this amazing beauty that's beneath the surface of our freshwater systems, and we don't even know it exists. We're losing freshwater biodiversity faster than we're losing biodiversity from any other ecosystem on the planet. And snails are a pretty good example of that, right? So we have 700 species of uh, freshwater snail in North America, 10% are already considered extinct. An additional 40% are endangered. So a full 50% of our freshwater snail fauna are endangered or already extinct. And another 25% are considered imperiled. So 75% of those 700 species are in trouble of going away forever. And they also uh, exemplify one of the reasons why I think we're losing that biodiversity, because we don't even know they exist. I mean, we know they're there, right? We, we have the scientific names. But they're really just names on a page and statistics. They're numbers to count. We really don't know the beauty and the intricacy um, and the diversity of our underwater freshwater systems, the stuff that's right here in the Manitoni and in the Schuylkill River. Um, and so you know, here's another good example of that. This is a trip I was running in um, New Hampshire in the Green Mountain National Forest. I run trips all across the country, do a lot of work with uh, the Forest Service to get people, especially kids, uh, face down in rivers in a, in a positive kind of way. Um, and so I got this group of kids here in the White River, and they're looking at it. They're, 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 they're having a great day. They're looking at a trout. In fact, they're looking at that trout. And, and one of the kids picks her head, head up out of the water and says, he's beautiful. I love him, assuming that that fish was a male. And puts her face back down in the water again. And then, you know, a couple minutes later, pops her head out of the water and says, how can we conserve something if we don't know it exists? Now, we know that that trout exists. We, we put it there. We stocked it, right? So we know it exists. But we don't know what it looks like on its terms. So we were just talking about my undergraduate and my graduate work, and I, I went to school for uh, environmental biology in undergrad and then ecological teaching and learning as a, a grad student. And my focus for both of those, those learning events were freshwater ecology and freshwater systems. And every time I did any work in river or stream, I took whatever was in that river or stream and took it out into my environment, into the air, so that I could study it. Or I put it in a tank in my office so I could watch it that way. I didn't snorkel it until I saw this movie called River Webs. And Riverwebs was a, a movie about a scientist named Shigeru Nakano, a Japanese scientist who did this amazing uh, ecological uh, research by observing fish and their behavior in streams in Japan. And I asked the question, I wonder what the rivers around here look like. This is about 15 years ago now. It was a movie done by Freshwaters Illustrated, so I strongly recommend checking out Freshwater Illustrated's work. It's absolutely stunning, definitely the leaders globally in documenting freshwater systems through videography. And so about you know, 15 years ago or so, I'm standing on the banks of this creek, the biggest in, 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 the, in the biggest town in my region, and I'm really debating about sticking my face in that water. Right? This is the Big L Creek, and the watershed is either all developed or ag. So it's, it's a pretty impacted system. Right? Very, very little forest left in that, in that watershed. And even right where I am, this is in the big, in, along the busiest street in the biggest town, and you can see that this is an impacted stream. Right? So we've got these sandbars that are indicative of a highly uh, energetic system. Because of that development, it flashes, just like a typical paved watershed's going to. We've got active erosion going over here. We've got litter all over the place. And this is a big old storm sewer outfall. So you can, we all know what comes in off of the storm sewers, right? Luckily, it's not a combined sewer system. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I stood there and I thought, you know, what's the point of even putting my face in this water? There's nothing worth seeing. And then the other half of that was, I was afraid somebody might see me sticking my face in that water. I mean, you don't, you don't snorkel a temperate creek. You snorkel a tropical reef. And so what would I tell people, and I still have this fear, what would I tell people if they saw me snorkeling in knee-deep water, in water that people don't think have anything worth watching? 911's um, been called a couple of times thinking that I was a body. But when I stuck my face in that water, there was this amazing world that was there. I mean, this, this incredible beauty and vibrancy and diversity of life that was just kind of hidden from view from that standpoint. And that's certainly far from a pristine stream. Um, and, and because it was far from pristine, I made the assumption that most people assume, I think, with a lot of our rivers and streams that, you know, what are we really going to see if we stick our faces in that water? Something like this. But when we actually take a look, there's really amazing life to see there. Even though we know it, that's a northern hogsucker, one of my favorite fish. 
Um, so it's not anything rare by any means, although we see rare stuff all the time, even around here. Again, because we're losing freshwater biodiversity so fast, it's not uncommon to see some fish that, or invertebrates that aren't going to be here for very much longer, even in our region. And so it's really changed my perspective on, on rivers and streams and, and, and how we connect people to rivers and streams. So I've got a background in, in, in outdoor education and currently run an outdoor education program, like I said. And the typical way that I, I connect kids to rivers was, you know, going out and seeing net fishing and, and benthic macroinvertebrate studies and canoe trips. And those are all very important pieces of this connecting um, uh, work. Although I found that putting kids face down in rivers with a mask and a snorkel on, again, in a good kind of way, safe kind of way, is amazing. And so here's, here's a group of fifth graders that I've got out. It's a beautiful May day. It's nice and warm. The water is clear. They're all engaged. I mean, they're all face down enjoying this stream. I got a principal over here talking about how this trip is meeting her required curriculum outcomes that they can't hit in the classroom, right? And we can do this in the outdoors better than what they're able to get in the classroom for these particular outcomes. And I'm just loving life. I'm thinking, this is amazing. And then there's this big commotion downstream. I'm thinking, oh, crud, what now? Well, this is what was what now. This fish is about three and a half feet long. It's a sea lamprey, right? It's native to here. They've got a bad reputation because they're invasive in the Great Lakes. And so anytime you hear about sea lamprey in the news, it's got the invasive tag attached to it. And so the perception is that they're bad, and they're not. They're amazing. And this is a migratory fish. This fish is at the end of its life. So this male has come up from the ocean. They spend most of their lives in, in, out at sea, come up from the ocean, and made this red, this big old nest, about a three-foot bowl. And you'll see his nose right here is all beat up in white. Just like salmon, if you've ever seen salmon at the end of their lifespan, at the end of their lives, their bodies are beat up from trying to reproduce. Same thing with this, with this lamprey. And so these kids love this fish, right? So again, they're native to here. One of the best snorkels I ever had was in the, in the uh, bush kill up at the Delaware Water Gap with a whole bunch of lamprey migrating. It was so cool. But they're maligned because of this, because they're not native in the Great Lakes. What fifth grader doesn't understand the concept of being misunderstood? Right? They love that fish because of that. They totally related to that, to that lamprey. So about nine months later, I'm snorkeling in the middle of winter in a small tributary nearby where that adult was found. It's, it's dark outside. I've got about a foot of ice on the creek. There's a little bit of open water where the water's flowing too fast for it to freeze. And I'm a little bit nervous about getting in. So river snorkeling is typically really, really safe. Right? You pick a safe spot to go. You don't have much to worry about. You're in shallow water. But water is always hazardous. And I'm at night with ice on the downstream side. And so if for whatever reason I get flushed off the bottom and flow under the ice sheet, I may or may not pop back up again. And I'm thinking, again, this probably isn't a really good idea, and it might be a waste of time. But I need to get in the water because it's been about three months. So I get in the water, and the first thing I see is this. This is a juvenile sea lamprey. Right? And these fish are amazing. This is actually a filter feeder. So they spend about six years living in fine sands and sediments as filter feeders. They have this oral hood. And they're a part of keeping our rivers clear. And we don't even know what their status is because they're not important enough. Now, they've got a bad reputation because they're parasitic, really predatory. The way they make a living is they latch onto the side of a fish. And they actually stay there until the fish is dead. So it's actually a form of predation rather than parasitism. And you, also, you know Jeremy Wade, the uh, river monster guy? And I love Jeremy because he always tries to put a conservation message at the, into his thing. But you know, he, he's got to get TV ratings, and so he sensationalizes things. And, he was going after the vampire fish, these lamprey, and he was making one attached to its neck, to his neck, like he's going to suck our blood. That's how they stabilize themselves. <laughs> That's, they, they, their sucker mouth is how they hang on. Um, and so we've got these other beauties here. These are our brook lamprey. Pennsylvania, I think, has four different species of brook lamprey, and they're all threatened. And these are some brook lamprey making red. These are small fish. They're only about that big. And they're making a red, and they're going to spawn. And these, this is happening right now. So in fact, tomorrow, I'm going looking for brook lamprey. Unfortunately, they, they spawn in, in first order streams. We all know how well protected first order streams are, right? They're not. Uh, a really cool paper came out in the 70s, and I contacted the author last spring. And I said, I want to go back to the spots that you went to along the Delaware where you found these fish. And he goes, you know what? I would love to give you those coordinates, but unfortunately, most of those have been bulldozed over already. Cool fish, primitive fish. These are all filter feeders, by the way. So even though they're a lamprey and they have that sucker mouth, they're not parasitic at all. They only filter feed. And as adults, when they metamorphose into an adult, they completely stop feeding and they only reproduce. That's the only thing they do in, in the last couple of days of their lives. And so, 
you know, snorkeling does a lot of things. It reveals these hidden fish and on their terms. And so getting, you know, getting to watch those tiny little brook lamprey spawn um, was, was fascinating last spring. But it also breeds hope. So these are some herring, and herring are running right now. They just started. I saw the first one up in a, in a tributary in the lower Delaware uh, last week. And so I can tell you that the river herring population, of the mid-Atlantic river herring population, has declined by 90% in the last 25 years. And those numbers are really concerning. But if I put a mask on you and I put you in a creek with those fish during the spawn so you could feel the chaos and the energy of that next generation being produced, those numbers become really real and tangible. And it becomes, a, for me anyway, a real concern that my grandkids might not be able to experience that. But at the same time, I'm in a river with tens of thousands of fish that are spawning and making the next generation. So while there's serious concern that they're going to go away, there's some real hope that they're going to continue on. And fortunately, the Delaware, the main stem anyway, is undammed. And so we still have relatively healthy runs of shad and herring coming up. The shad are struggling for, at times, but compared to a lot of other rivers in the mid-Atlantic, we still have really strong runs of those fish in the Delaware watershed. And so a lot of times in outdoor ed, the message is negative, right? What do you hear in that seashell? Well, I hear sea level rising. I hear bluefin tuna being hunted to extinction. I hear boat people crying. I want my iPod back. And there's some really solid research that's starting to come out from social, social scientists that indicate that one of the reasons why we're so distracted by the Kardashians or whoever the superstar is du jour is because of this, is because reality is a little bit too scary for us to face a lot of times. And what river snorkeling does is it, it tempers some of those negative messages with a real hope, right? Those fish are declined by 90% over the last 25 years. There's fishing moratoriums now. We think they're turning the corner and coming back up in number. And by the way, in about two weeks, stick your face in a river, and if you're in the right river, you're going to see thousands of these fish making the next generation to carry on. Some other unexpected fish. You see these things? The, the lighting's not great on this, but these are big fish. They're about that big around, and they're about that big. And, and I'm in a rapid, I'm barely hanging on. So I've got, I'm like a kite in a breeze right here. I got my hand on a rock, I got my other hand on a camera, and I'm just kind of hanging on. And I'm like, what are these big, rotund, not very fit fish doing in a rapid when that shad is having a hard time? And shad are made to get in that water, right? They're, they're dorsally compressed, and they've got that, that really powerful forked tail. Well, those are quillback, and those are migrants as well. We only hear about these long-distance migrants, like the sea lamprey and like the herring. But quillback live in big river systems like the Delaware, and will move into smaller tribs to spawn. And it was absolutely amazing just seeing these, these fish that really don't look like they belong there, but are certainly out swimming me in that, in that rapid. We've got some other fish that are a little bit more well known, like this one. So I'm actually, this is a very curious fish. So you'll see my fingers wiggle there in a minute. I'm doing this right next to the camera. And that's a male smallmouth. So he was guarding his nest on the bottom at about 10 feet of water and decided to come up and investigate what was going on on the surface. And here's another smallie. This is up on the upper Delaware who did not like that I was there. <laughs> and then there's a rock bass who didn't like that the smallmouth was there. There's the rock bass. And so the rock bass had a nest right here. These are all eggs. And so I'm pretty sure the rock bass is taking on the smallmouth to protect its nest. And maybe I was on the smallies nest, and that why, that's why uh, the fish was taken on me. But you get to see these really in intricate behaviors that you don't just quite get when you pull them out of the water in a seine net. And one of the reasons that we have some fairly healthy fish populations is because the Delaware's got these amazing grasses. All right, so I did this float from uh, Eschback to... Bushkill, I think, is what, where the takeout was. About a five-mile snorkel, which is exhausting, by the way, but absolutely amazing. And all these grasses were just loaded with fish, like this juvenile smallmouth. But even better than that were these schools of young-of-the-year herring and shad. I mean, how hopeful is that when you see the young-of-the-year? This was in the fall, and so these fish were, were spawned um, you know, within, that, within that calendar year. And then even further north, this is right near Hancock. And I don't know if you can see these. I have no idea what they are. They're little eyes with squiggles for tails, but they're baby fish. And there's a lot of them. And every time I see reproduction in ecology, in the environment, that's hope. Right? That population is going to continue on. And so we have a fair amount of diversity 
um, in the Delaware. So we've got a, a, a largemouth there. We've got a, a sunny over here. We've got, uh, looks like a, a black-nosed dace right here. We've got a couple of, of chubs. And chubs are kind of neat fish. These aren't them, but I'll tell you where the chub comes in in a minute. These are bait, right? So these are common shiners. When you go to a tackle store and you buy bait, when you buy shiners, nine times out of ten you're getting these. And like a lot of freshwater fish, they put on amazing colors in the spring to attract mates. And so these common shiners are trying to impress the opposite sex, and they're on this clean gravel bed. And you see that guy that's bringing the pebbles to the party? Here he comes again. Maybe. There he is, right there. That's the chub. That's his house. So he's building this mound of clean gravel, but all the, uh, the common shiners are taking advantage of it. And so we call them the architects of the stream. The one thing that all those fish that we've talked about so far have in common is they all need clean gravel to spawn. They can't spawn where there's a lot of sediment load. And what's happening to our rivers? All right, sediment. I mean, the keynote this morning, we're losing forest at a crazy rate. And we, knew, we know that the loss of forest means more sediment, right? But this guy produces his own clean sediment by bringing those pebbles in and, and making that clean, clean mound. They, they grow these tubercles, and he's, this one is just starting to, sp to sprout these little horns on their faces. We don't exactly know what those horns do. We think they might be um, involved in sparring, because sometimes you'll see males knocking each other another out of the way, but we're not 100% sure why they grow those, those horns. And they, they turn a beautiful aqua marine color, the horns, and some of the, the chub faces will get blue and purple. Here's some more bait. Banded killies, one of the most common fish that we have in the... In the uh, uh, Delaware estuary, and they move from the estuary up into fresh water um, in, the, in the fall. And so this is my theory. Um, when we have a bunch of bay grasses up in, in, uh, in, in the season, these fish are out hiding in the bay grasses. When it gets cold and those grasses die off and senesce, they're easy pickings for, for bass. And so they all come up into um, where streams go into the main stem of the river, like this. This is a school of, I don't know how many thousands of banded killie fish. It's like swimming through a cloud of, of uh, a fish. Really amazing. And this only happens in the fall, right? So it happens right about when all those bay grasses die back because of cold weather. And then they come up into pretty shallow water where there's a lot fewer predators to pick these fish off. So that's what I think is going on is a predation avoidance um, at that season change. And here's some other minnows. These are all um, spot tail shiners taken uh, right where a small tributary comes into the Delaware River. Um, right at Thanksgiving, in fact. Some other amazing hidden biology, and the Delaware is famous for these as well. Um, freshwater mussels, uh, incredible filters. So a, a guy by the name of Bill Lellis did a study on the Delaware River um, where he, he did a, a, a complete population estimate of uh, Elliptio complinata primarily, eastern Elliptio mussels, which is the dominant species that we have on the Atlantic Slope and figured out that eastern Liptios are filtering as much water as, or 10 times more water as the city of Baltimore uses in a day. Right, so they've got an in-current, ex-current siphon. They're taking water in through their in-current siphon. They're filtering everything out of that water, right? So sediments, algae, any other kind of plankton, any particulate that might be in that water, they're filtering out. They're picking out the parts that they can eat from that and sending it to their stomach, and the parts that they can't eat, they wad up and they spit it to the bottom in what's called pseudofeces. So they do this amazing cleaning um, service for us. A guy in, at Hopkins, a professor at Hopkins, figured out that they filter out particles as small as virus particle sized, and they kill the virus. Wow. So not only are they doing water clarity service for us, they're also doing human health service for us. Right? The, one of the amazing pieces of these animals is they've got a pretty complicated uh, reproductive cycle. And so you've got male and female, um, mussels, the fertilized female produces these things called glycidia or larva, right? So they're not quite a mussel yet. They need an intermediary host that they'll live on as a parasite for about a month. And while they're attached to the, either the gills or the fins of this intermediary host, they metamorphose and they become this juvenile uh, freshwater mussel and then they drop to the bottom, become a subadult, and become adults. Well, some of these mussels, we've got 275 species of freshwater mussel in North America. 75% are endangered. Surprise, right? Here we go again, just like our, our snails. But one of the reasons why they're endangered is because some of these species depend on one single species of fish. They're that specific. And some of the lures that they developed are amazing. Now, the elliptios that we have here don't do a lot of lure work, but some of the uh, uh, mussels not far out of the Delaware watershed 
The females develop lures that look like minnows, they look like helgramites. It's absolutely un amazing how uncanny those lures are. And so they'll just wiggle those lures out there to get a fish to come in and, and bite on that lure. And then she opens up her marsupial gills and infests the fish with her, her young. It's uh, fascinating. Glycidia, this is, this is in the Delaware River at night at Worthington. Don't tell Worthington I did that because you're not supposed to snorkel there at all, and especially not at night. But it's a great spot. Um, <laughs> So there's, there's an Elliptio complinata right here. And I'm actually trying to get shad. I'm trying to get shad spawning. I, you know, I'm in my tent at 10 o'clock, and I hear all the splashing going. I'm like, oh, i got to get out there and get this. And you know, shatter these things that are just going to stay just outside your light range. <laughs> they're just going to tease you, to let you know that you're there, but that they're there, but not let you get a picture. But what was going on is all this white stuff is in the water. I'm like, it's like a cobweb. I'm like, what is this stuff? That's the Glycidia from Elliptio complinata, because they depend on these fish for reproduction. That's an American eel. Right? And you can see, not 100%, not they're not obligate to use American eel for reproduction. They use a bunch of other fish too, but largely American eel. There's a pretty close association with Lithio complinata and American eel. And you can see why that, that webby stuff makes a lot of sense, right? So you see how eels just kind of slither through that cobble. If, if, if uh, Eastern Lithios are putting their glycidia out as a cobweb through that cobble, that eel's just going to kind of swim through and become infested. Eels are another migratory fish. So they're one of the most abundant fish that we have in the Delaware and the Susquehanna River watersheds. They live their entire lives up in freshwater, 25 to 30 years. And then they migrate in the, in the fall to the Sargasso Sea. And this is new science. We suspected they went to the Sargasso Sea. It's basically the Bermuda Triangle. Um, but we never really proved it until, I think, two years ago. One radio-tagged eel from uh, New England was followed to the Sargasso and figured out, okay, that's where they really are going. So think about the physiology change. They're living in relatively shallow fresh water for most of their lives, and they're going to 3,000 feet of marine. So switching from fresh to salt, from no pressure to crazy pressure. And the babies come back out, and this is a baby eel. And they come back out, and unfortunately, they hit dams in a lot of our rivers. So Conowingo Dam, the first one in the Susquehanna, 10,000 elvers a day try to get back through Conowingo in June, July, and August, and can't. It's a 100-foot wall of concrete. There's fish lifts on that dam, but they're really designed for shad and herring, and they're marginally successful for those. And we just found this out. This is a, a scientist, Julie Devers, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, just figured this out in like two or three years ago. So it's a, a new problem. Elliptio complinate is a long-lived mussel. They live to be 100 years old. We're not seeing recruitment of Elliptio above Conowingo Dam in the Susquehanna River. We're seeing plenty of recruitment below it. We think there's a link to the eels. Uh, they just did a, a, an experiment where they, they trucked a whole bunch of eels up into Pine Creek in Pennsylvania in the Susquehanna watershed and dumped them there. And all of a sudden, they saw recruitment of Elliptio complinata after they did that transplant. Now, again, fortunately, the main stem of the Delaware is undammed. And so the eels, shad, have a relatively free run. But we do have pollution blocks that we're, learning start to, uh, we're starting to learn uh, impede migration of fish. And certainly, that the Delaware River acts like the dam system because of all the reservoirs on the, on the mid and upper reaches that you know, release water. So we've got pretty high fluctuations. Um, if it's not timed right, it does a lot of damage. These are really maligned, and they're absolutely beautiful. I'm not a big snake person. Um, I used to love snakes when I was a kid, and I grabbed a couple too many and got bit. Recognized that you know, if you grab them, they're going to grab you back. But they're beautiful animals. And you know, the number of times where I'm walking down to a creek to get in the water, and it's a popular swimming hole, and I hear all these people hauling out of that swimming hole saying, hey, don't go down, there's a copperhead. And it's not. It's a, it's a beautiful water snake. And this is uh, at, um, again, Worthington up on the Delaware. And you know, nine times out of ten, this snake didn't know, I, didn't know I was there, and so I was able to get in relatively close. This one, as soon as it saw me, took off, and I couldn't keep up with it to try to get a good picture of it until it went down to the bottom. And so you can just see its head right here curled around a rock. They are amazing fishers. Just incredibly agile in the water, amazing swimmers. And again, I'm not going to go grab one because I'll get grabbed back, but they're maligned for no reason. Even if they were a copper, there's no reason to stone them. The number of stoned water snakes that I find is really sad because they're a top predator in the system. And besides, they just don't deserve to be stoned because they're a snake. In all seasons, the river is amazing. So this is at um, Washington Crossing in December, I think, late December. Really cold, didn't want anybody to see me again, worried about the 911 thing. Um, 
stick my face in the water, and I find these, these, these organisms. These are really cool. These are northern casemaker caddisflies. So you can see the case is right here, and here's the insect. They, they build big cases. Northern casemakers look like twigs walking on the bottom. Um, I find entire eddies in the wintertime full of these things swirling around on the bottom. So this is the, the larval form of a winged adult, right? So they live, depending on the species of caddisfly, will live one to two years underwater and then emerge as a winged adult. Northern casemakers are one of my favorites because they're so big. And here's a good shot of one. You just kind of take a whole twig and cobble it together with another whole twig and wind up making this pretty large case and walk along the bottom as they graze. And here's one that just kind of shows how amazingly strong they are. So right here, you can see this northern casemaker just hanging on for dear life. And I'm in another rapid where I'm having a hard time holding on myself. And I don't have this big sail of a body that's trying to rip me off the rock. And so, again, by taking people into a river, and maybe a river that looks like this from the surface, but as soon as you break the surface, you see life like this. And this is, this is real. That fish was right where that first picture was taken. It changes our perspective that there's amazing life that really needs protection in that river, just for its own sake, for its own beauty, for its own diversity. This is a green darter, a really common fish in, in the Delaware watershed. Here's a tessellated darter. Whoops. There's a tessellated darter. Some of the most color fish, colorful fish that we have in our waters are darters. Uh, a couple hundred species in North America. Most of that diversity and color is in the southeastern part of the U.S. So that southeastern U.S. is the mecca for freshwater biodiversity globally. Um, but even here, where we've been glaciated and we've been inundated with seawater in our geologic history, so we don't have the speciation that the southeastern U.S. has, we still have these amazing, colorful fish species, especially this one. And that's not color enhanced. That's not altered. That's the real deal. That's what it looked like the day I took that picture. Um, that's a brook trout. We've got some amazing brook trout um, breeding populations in the Delaware watershed. And these are the canaries in the coal mine. And so EPA has estimated that uh, in another 100 years, we're not going to have any brooks east of the Rockies. The brooks west of the Rockies are all non-native and invasive. We introduced them there. Brook trout are the only native fish that we have, native trout, that we have in the east. And that's because of climate change. They depend on clear, cold water to, to, uh, to, to thrive and to live and our streams in the east are warming. And without any intervention, the estimate is 100 years before we don't have any native trout left east of, the, east of the Rockies. Now, on the hopeful side, these fish were in a stream that is just on the edge of their range, on the thermal limit. So there's a good chance that these are already thermally adapted. And so rather than being the canaries in the coal mine that are going to die off first, they might be the ones that are thermally adapted that will carry the species forward. Uh, but there's a lot of work being done on brook trout right now. And one of the most amazing snorkels I ever did was on pine, um, the bush kill at Big, Big Pine Road, I think it was, in the Poconos. Did not expect to see this, and I don't know what, it was, what was going on, but I'm going back there again the same day this year to see if I can capture it. Hundreds of adult brook trout all congregated in a big pool in, uh, in early April. An incredible uh, congregation of, of these just beautiful, beautiful fish. And again, every time I go in, I'm wondering, are we looking at one of the last ones? And hoping not, right? But that's always in the back of my mind. Um, are they going away, and is this going to be one of the last shots that we get of them? And we've got crayfish, and a bunch of crayfish. And there was just a talk this morning that I missed, which I wanted to go to, about crayfish in, in Pennsylvania. This is one of our natives, right? So this is an Appalachian brook crayfish. Um, love crayfish. When I was a kid, I used to play with them all the time. This is one that's not native. This one wants to bite my face off. And this is, this is one of the non-natives that we had. This is a rusty-sided crayfish. Really a beautiful animal in spite of being invasive. Right? I mean, look at the colors on that. Um, obvious where it gets its name, right, from that, that rusty-colored thorax or the body. And then really beautiful aqua, aqua claws. We've got other things that will give you a nip, too. Right? That's a helgramite. Right? Dobson fly or a fish fly. You might see the winged adults, they're about that big when they, when, when they transform into an adult, and the males have the really big pinchers that are completely and totally useless, and the females have the pinchers that are really draw blood if you let them. Another predator is a dragonfly. Um, they live about two years underwater. Top predator in the water, top predator in the air. Absolutely amazing. They've got this huge jaw. Have we ever do that when you get a, a dragonfly? You, you pull the jaw down a little bit and you show the kids how wide the gape is. 
So a, a, a dragonfly like that could take a tadpole for prey. And we already talked about snails a little bit. Here's another caddis. Like I said, there's a couple hundred different uh, caddisfly species. Most of those are case makers. This happens to be a free living one. It kind of looks like uh, Jabba the Hutt. I wonder if that's where they got the idea. Um, but this green caddis is really beautifully colored. And again, it'll live in the water for a year to two years, transform into a winged adult. Here are some more case makers. And you see this one with its, with its arms up in the air. Uh, that's feeding. Let me go back to that one. All right? So puts its arms up in the air and is catching whatever food particle comes down the stream and then kind of licks off their arms. And there's another one of the same species. And here's a whole community of them. And there's a couple of different things going on here. So you see the ones that have this little white in the, in the tube openings. Those are pupating. So they've sealed themselves in there. And they're starting to metamorphose into an adult. You've got some empty tubes. And you've got one larva right there. Another kind of caddis we see a lot, a lot, a lot, web spinners. So in that kind of a concentration, that's pretty normal for a, a relatively healthy stream. But these are also an indicator of a eutrophic stream. So when you go into a creek and you see nothing but web spinners all over the place, it's really cool because they're a cool insect. Um, but it's an indicator that we've got an over-fertilized waterway. And so these are just wind socks. And so the current's coming this way, and they're filtering all this food out in that web. And in the, in the bottom of that sock, or nearby, is a caddisfly larva that will come out and eat the food off the web. This is one of the most amazing feats I've seen. So this silver bug right here is a female caddisfly. So she's already hatched. She's been mated. And now she's crawling back underwater to lay her eggs. Now think about that task, right? She's, she's silver. She has a bunch of fine hairs on her body. So she's got a little bit of a layer of air so she can respire as she's, as she's crawling down the face of this rock. But she's in a rapid. So first of all, she's got this water hazard. She's an air-breathing organism now, not water, right? So she's got this, the, the basics of staying alive on top of being easy pickings for every fish out there. And she's just crawling down the face of that. Not just her. There's hundreds of them on this rock that are making this migration from air back to water to lay eggs underwater. It's absolutely amazing. This is a beautiful, beautiful insect. This is a, a mayfly golden mayfly on a golden rock, but you see these gills right here. This is one of the reasons why mayflies and stoneflies are such amazing indicators of pretty good water quality. I mean, think about it if your lungs were outside your body. We at least have from here to here to filter impurities out before, we get to the, before they get to the lungs, right? With gills like that, there's no filtration. They're directly exposed to whatever's in the water, good or bad. And here's a really beautiful stony. Stonies are one of my, my favorite insects because they turn into these. Here's the, 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 uh, the nymph crawling out of the water onto these uh, grasses. And then they, they come out through this suture on their exoskeleton as a winged adult. So I'm running a trip with, man, I think we had 100 kids. It was actually with the Delaware, Delaware Riverkeeper Network. They run a, a sojourn with, uh, with kids from uh, the UN school in New York City every year. It's this amazing event, five days on the river, 100 kids in canoes. And at one of the stops, we take them snorkeling. And so I get there early because I get to hang out on the river for a while. And the grasses are moving. And I'm like, what's going on with this? And well, this is what was going on with this. We had this major stonefly hatch. So all these stonies are crawling out. I'm watching this. All these stonies are crawling out of the river, up onto these, these grasses. They're splitting open their backs. The adults emerge, and they find a mate. And the next generation is produced. Now, those stones came from, from, uh, from the Delaware, but a lot of stoneflies are coming from rivers that look like that. Can you guess which watershed is forested more than the other one? I mean, look at that color compared to this one, right? Yeah, this one is, is still fairly water, uh, forested, and this one is almost all ag and suburbia, right? And the problem is, you know, stoneflies, mayflies, eels, shad, herring, lamprey, everything we talked about today live there, or they should live there. But we have too much sedimentation, and sedimentation is a normal process, right? We should have periods in the year when we have heavy sediment loads. It's normal. The problem is we've, we've overdone that. We've removed forests, and again, the, the forests are disappearing in the, in the Delaware watershed at an alarming rate. That results in increased sedimentation. It winds up with bottoms that look like that, right? just smothers any kind, of, any kind of habitat that might be there. 
Um, certainly no clean gravel for spawning. Something else that we see underwater sometimes, that's what eutrophic uh, streams look like underwater. Right? Just this algal fur that's just pretty, pretty nasty. And this is why we can't have nice things. Right? Warning, combined sore uh, outfall. The number of streams that we're not able to snorkel kids in because of fecal coliform is ridiculous. And this is the United States, right? And yet we can't contact water because of raw sewage. I'm trying to run trips in uh, the Shenandoah Valley with the Forest Service. You would think that the Shenandoah Valley with George Washington National Forest on both ridges uh, that flank the Shenandoah River would be fine to run trips. Constantly comes up hot for fecal coliform. Right? So it's a, it's a nation, national problem, and it's one that's kind of, it's heartbreaking. I mean, how is it possible that in the United States today we, we have to worry about contacting water because it's going to make us sick? Here's another thing that's going on, right? Just a, just a storm sore outfall, not combined sore at all. But look at the color of that. And these are becoming more and more common fish consumption advisories. Right now, a lot of that is due to mercury, right? Aerial deposition of mercury coming from coal-fired power, clean coal, right? Coming from coal-fired power plants. Um, Ohio Valley weather comes to us and deposits whatever is put into the atmosphere in the Ohio Valley. So right under, this is on the Brandywine, in fact. And so right underneath that sign, again, I'm there, I'm like, eh, maybe, maybe not. And this is a place where I wouldn't take kids or people, right? For me, no problem, I'm gonna go in there, I'm not worried about it, but I'm not gonna put other people's, and I, I took my kids there, <laughs> but um, I'm not gonna put other people's children there. Um, and the first thing I saw was this bass. Whoops, that bass right there, on, right underneath that sign. So maybe the bass knew that people weren't going to fish there, or at least you know catch and release. Um, and then this beautiful mussel bed. This fish, this picture of this fish was taken right out here, in the Schuylkill, right at the, at the mouth of the Manitowoc. And when I was there, people were like, "Are you really going in that water? Ew! Um, that's a pretty amazing golden shiner." Right? In water that's, that's perceived to be really sick and impaired. We industrialize our rivers, right? That happens to be Three Mile Island right there, but we've got another nuclear plant right here, right? The Susquehanna is completely industrial um, with coal fired power plants and dams and nuclear power plants. The Delaware, the lower Delaware certainly is, is very, very similar. And yet, in the shadows of all that industrial, industrialization, we find life like this, right? So everywhere we look, there's this amazing beauty and life that, that just needs to be told. That story needs to be told. And so I was, I was on the Susquehanna with a, a reporter who was doing a story about river snorkeling for Susquehanna Magazine. And he asked me this question about whether I thought rivers were healthier or, or more sick than when I was a kid growing up. And um, I, I came out with this book about river snorkeling, and I, I put that conversation in the end of this book because I think it kind of encapsulates where we are and where we've come from. Our rivers aren't nearly as pristine as they were 200 years ago. They aren't nearly as polluted as they were 50 years ago. We've come a long way with the passage of laws in the 1970s as part of the Clean Water Act and other regulations under the National Environmental Policy Act. But we have a long way to go. We've come too far and made too much progress to give up on our rivers now. Mrs. Beck, my elderly German neighbor when I was growing up who lived across the Pumpkin, Pumpkin Patch Creek, used to show me photos of stringers full of native trout that came from what is now not much more than a trickle of a creek. At the time, she and her husband caught those trout. The watershed of that stream was forested, and theirs was the only house. By the time I came to know the pumpkin patch, it was degraded by decades of suburbia. I still love that creek, though, and I dreamt of a time when the pumpkin patch could be restored to what it was when Ruth and Carl first moved to Colonia. It's about shifting baselines. My baseline, or my memory, of what defines a healthy stream is actually a degraded condition compared to what once was. The information Mrs. Beck's photos provided was the only way I knew that what I perceived as pristine was far from it. I want my photos to serve the same purpose. I want my photos to remind us not to settle for less than what could be, because that's all we remember. But unlike Mrs. Beck's photos that show a lost abundance, I really hope my photos show a return to improved stream health. I hope my grandkids look at my portfolio and say, can you believe how few herring there were compared to now? I hope the baseline shifts to the positive. Our ecological memory has a lot to do with what we perceive as normal in today's environment. How we recognize if our streams are becoming impaired is based on how we define normal, which is largely based on memory. 
It's heartbreaking to think that my grandkids might not even miss springtime herring runs. They might, might not even know they ever existed in order to recognize that they are missing. The concept of shifting baselines usually pertains to ecosystems becoming impaired and us not realizing it's generation to generation. I'm finding that my baseline wavers back and forth, but generally that streams are in better shape now than when I was a kid. That doesn't mean we stop working for the protection. It means that what we're doing is working and we need to do more. So I was telling you about Freshwater's Illustrated at the beginning, right? And one of the movies that, that they came out with was called Lost Fish. And it's about Pacific lamprey. But one of the things I really like about Freshwater's Illustrated stories is it tells the human piece of it. It's not just the ecological story, but it's the, the human part of it, the human reliance. And in the case of Lost Fish, this man, Elmer Crow, is a Nez Perce Indian who recognized in the 1970s that he might have seen the last eel. So Nez Perce called Pacific lamprey eel heavily dependent on eel for food and as part of their culture in ritual and ceremony. And Elmer in the, in the, in the Snake River saw what he thought was the last one. And he single-handedly started a restoration project to preserve and protect um, Pacific lamprey. And dams are a problem for those lamprey. And so they do a trap and transport program. Elmer unfortunately died in 2013. But you know, his sentiment and what, how he lived his life is encapsulated in this quote from him, right? We are the circle, that's what life is all about. We take care of one another, so when we have someone in trouble, that's when the rest of us have to step in. And so I wanna end with that concept, coupled with the idea of upriver versus downstream, right? A lot of times we say, well, we all live downstream. And that's a pretty powerless position, right? Because I can't impact the people that live upriver from me. But if I think about it that I live upriver, that I impact people downstream for me, then all of a sudden I'm pretty empowered, right? And that's what Elmer did, right? He lived upriver, he lived upstream, and he took action to correct a problem that he saw. And now there's a restoration program going on um, in Idaho to try to restore those Pacific lamprey. And there's some positive results coming out of that. And while that's West Coast, that story is really, really similar to what we have here on the Delaware and on the East Coast. And so thanks for coming to learn a little bit about snorkeling. Um, anybody have any questions at all? So I want to start doing this at my nature center. How do you decide whether it's safe for kids? Or yeah, so I can help you through that. So send me an email, and I will, I will be happy to come out and take a look. But I, I, I gauge sites based on water depth and water velocity, and then um, any kind of hazards, like any kind of strainers. Okay. And then I look at water quality, right? So does the state have the waters listed as, as impaired for anything? Um, and if they do, sometimes I'll do my own tests. Like I, t I, I do my own fecal coliform test just because it's so, um, so many rivers are listed as impaired. But a lot of times that's related to storm events. And so if I'm between storm events, and also, you know, the, the, the difference between combined storm, storm sewer outfalls versus uh, ag impacts. If I've got a combined storm sewer that's causing that fecal coliform exceedance, then I'm probably going to stay away from that water. If it's a farm impact, I'm more likely to go in only because it's not a human coliform that I'm working with. Um, and then there's other logistical issues like uh, access. You know, think about getting 25 kids in and out of the water without destroying the stream bank. Um, and then what, what can we see under the water? Um, habitat um, diversity usually leads to uh, fish diversity. And then do you buy like high quality masks for snorkels um, Walmart? Walmart stuff is fine. I typically buy from Blue Water Gear online. They have a, a, a fleet of rental gear that is bomb proof. It's one size fits all. It's all the same color because you know when you get a bunch of sixth graders out there, if it's, I want that color. So it just, you know, it's, it's bomb proof gear, it's their rental line. Um, send me an email, I could put you in touch. I can give, and I'm not, I'm not endorsing them by any means, I don't work for them, but that's just the gear that worked for me. Um, the, the program that I worked with in the Cherokee National Forest just has an assortment of different kinds of masks and snorkels that they use. Um, I, I have some GoPros that I, I stake out in water and in shallow water to do that. Um, in fact, I have a meeting in D.C. next week with the Forest Service talking about an underwater ROV to do just that, to develop um, some video and some VR um, technology. And I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, I, I like the idea of getting video and getting uh, kids to see video, but I like the idea more of getting them actually in the creek, you know, because the total experience and I don't want virtual reality to take the place of that authentic thing, but that's better than nothing, right? Yeah. Um, how are you able to get 
so close to some of these fish and other animals uh, scaring them away? Yeah, good question. Um, it's, it's about uh, finding one spot in the creek that you're comfortable in and just staying there and, and, and kind of blending in. And um, what I find is that when I'm, when I'm um, nervous or anxious or rushing around, I don't see anything. But when I find one spot and I just kind of chill, then things come out. And you just become part of the creek. You know, you just kind of, you blend in. Um, and some of these are zoomed in, right? So this one, I wasn't nearly this close to that. That's a sculpin, by the way, really, really cool fish. Um, I wasn't nearly that close to that fish. I was probably from, from here to that, to that eraser, right? So a couple feet away. And that's a fish that's about that big, right? But I can typically get those herring shots, the video, that was real time. They were that close. They were just smashing into me. Right? So, but again, I, I was there for about 10 minutes before they finally figured out that I was just another rock. <laughs> it didn't, didn't matter. Uh, we heard a little bit about uh, the steps you take to think about water, water quality and like, just like safety issues. Uh, I'd love to hear more about how you uh, relay that to the folks you're trying to attract to the water. Yeah. Um, particularly in thinking about like CSO impacted streams or other impacted streams um, where like uh, a little bit of environmental literacy can actually be a deterrent to safely engaging with that water and you got to get to that next level to understand well I can't swim after rain but I actually can swim you know 300 days out of the year. Right yeah that's a that's an excellent question it's something that I struggle with a lot um, and that last point especially, that a little bit of environmental literacy sometimes is a deterrent. But it's really just having a conversation with folks and meeting them and saying, you know, this water does have a problem after rain events. We're not going to put anybody in the water after a rain event. We do our own testing um, to make sure that we're at safe levels. Um, you know, most of the groups that I, that I, I work with are school groups. They're school-based. So it's not so much having those conversations with individual families, but rather with school officials. And you're going to take my kids and put them in water? So that's the, the number one concern from the schools, not even thinking about water quality, they're just thinking about drowning. And so I work with them a lot. And you're, you're going to scuba dive with my kids? No, we're not scuba diving. We're snorkeling, very different. And I, I tell them, this is the spot that we've selected, and these are the hazards. I've identified the hazards, and we're mitigating them, right? So the water's knee deep. We're not going in over anybody's head. Every kid is wearing a life jacket. If they're not in a wetsuit, I try to put them in wetsuits to keep them a little bit insulated, and which is all automatic flotation. Right? But if I don't have enough wetsuits or for whatever reason we're not going wetsuits that day, everybody's wearing a PFD because we don't have to dive to the bottom. We're just in the surface. And so we've got systems in place to mitigate the water hazard, just the drowning hazard. I've got the staffing. We have four people to 20, 20 kids, for example. We've got two people in the water as guides. We've got two people on the shore as, as lifeguards. Um, and then the water quality issues, I'm just very much up front with people. I'm like, yeah, that's a concern that I have too. And this is how we're generating data to make sure that we're not going to run into that problem. The brain eating back, the brain eating amoebas drive me crazy. You know, I was on a, I was doing a web, a, a national webinar about a month ago on, on how to put a program together. And I got that question about how do you deal with brain eating amoeba, amoebas? And I'm like, oh. you know, that happens like once, once a summer nationwide. It's such a really non threat. Um, but it's a concern to people, and so, you know, perception is reality. It's both. Yeah, both. Um, yeah, adults like it as well. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Okay. Yeah. Do you ever worry, though, like the parents who send their kids to these snorkeling programs, like, oh, it's just because you're distracted for a little bit? And I've, actually, I've absolutely had that, and I had to change my rules on that. Right? So I, I do a lot of work with some nature centers. And so I'll bring my gear, and I'll run a program at a nature center. And the nature center really wanted And so my age cutoff is what changed, because it became a daycare. Um, and I don't mind doing the daycare thing. But for snorkeling, if anybody like under 10 years old, it's just, they're just a little bit too young to be able to maintain themselves in the water. And they just become a distraction to the other kids. And so I was getting six-year-olds dropped off by mom and dad, and then they were ducking out. Right? And I'm like, we can't do that anymore. And so now from 10 and up, um, it eliminates that problem. The kids still might get dropped, but they're much more able to maintain themselves. And, you know, we're not spending a lot of time just with a six-year-old um, just trying to get them into the water, okay. you know. Are there any streams within Philadelphia or close to Philadelphia that would be clean enough to do this? Uh, yes, depending on day. Um, but I'm looking at a couple, actually. Some of the children that turn on water work, we have a lot of yeah. programs getting kids in the boat. Yep, right. 
great. Yeah, no, we'd love to work with you on figuring that out. And um, yeah, there's a couple that come to the top of mind that I've, I've looked at. I need to check the latest water quality data, but give me an email and we'll, we can get together and okay. figure it out okay. for sure. Thank you. I like how bad I swim in those water bodies. Again, it's, uh, when, the when matters, but I swim in the Schuylkill and Delaware all the time. But I'll also flag, uh, I think it might be a city ordinance about getting in the water and swimming. Maybe the snorkeling is a different issue. Right. That's another thing that I, um, uh, I think needs, needs to change. I yeah. Think, you know, we, oh, it, it definitely. We clean air, clean water, right. and, and the, the thought that That's the city right. could keep us out of our fish yeah. is uh, outrageous to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I, I deal with that a lot. Right? Like I was telling, I was joking about Worthington. Right? And I got, I got warned when I checked in at the campground. You can, and they, don't, they didn't know who I was. They didn't know I was a snorkeler. It's just their standard thing. You're not allowed to swim in that river because they have drownings. And then for whatever reason, the state gets sued because they didn't protect their water. Um, and I typically ignore that. Um, I usually have a conversation with the park manager to make sure that, look, I'm not swimming. I'm snorkeling. It's a different thing. I'm safe. I'm a swift water rescue tech. I know how to handle myself in the water. Uh, but that's certainly a concern that needs to be addressed if there's an ordinance for whatever reason to keep people out of water. We don't want to go and break that rule and have more problem, but we can work through that. Great. Okay. Can you talk about like a typical uh, program? So it's yeah. Basic grade and eighth grader. Yep. Uh, it takes X minutes to, to okay, sure. the year, then you have a summary at the end. Yeah. Like We're really flexible, um, but the ideal is uh, a group of about 20 to 20, in one class, you know, 25 to 30 kids max. Um, I won't put more than 20 kids in the water at a time. So let's say we have a class of 20. Um, we, we, we teach on themes, and so we're pretty specific uh, and, and laser sighted on what do we want kids to get out of that day. Um, and it's easy to shotgun this kind of stuff, to have too many kind of different concepts come in at the same time. And so depending on where I'm at and what the, uh, what the idea is, with the Forest Service, the idea is forested watersheds equal clean, drinkable, safe, clear water for humans and fish. And so I focus in on that, right? So, we talk about, and we have, we have curriculum developed for this, by the way. So we have pre-trip curriculum that we, I, we would love teachers to do in the classroom before they get kids outside, but there's no requirement at all to have that happen. But that curriculum is really focused on watershed and the concepts around watershed and land use, and then personal action, what can I do to keep water clean? And so we typically start with you know, a welcome off the bus and why are we here today, and take a look around, what land use do you see right here? And now we're gonna go explore the, the water, and then we get them geared up in a stepwise fashion. We start with wetsuits, we have changing tents so kids can change into a bathing suit if they're not wearing a bathing, bathing suit. Get them into wetsuits, get them down to the river, um, give them masks and snorkels, very, very stepwise and orderly. Have them kneel in the water just to get used to it. Um, put your face in the water without swimming around, take a couple of breaths, and we're checking each other. We're checking them right, to make sure they're okay. And then we start you know, floating and just kind of getting used to being buoyant. And then we, kind of, we give them boundaries, specific boundaries. And then we expand those boundaries as they get more comfortable. And then the two guides in the water, their job, everybody's job is to count heads and make sure everybody's safe. But the two guides are also pointing things out. And once they see one or two fish, then they're on their own and they're figuring things out on their own. Um, and then we do that twice in, a, in an ideal day, right? So we'll do that the first, in the, in the morning, the first session is just, you're going to get, you're excited, you're going to splash and chaos. We're okay with that. Be a kid in a creek. Just go be a kid in a creek. And then in the afternoon, we, we, or then in the second shift, we give them a task. And we want, and we usually, it's usually focused on biodiversity, but again, it depends on the stream. If we're in a cold water fishery stream where we're looking at, at trout more than diversity, it'll focus on the number of different kinds of trout you can see. But it's typically, I want you to go and see how many different kinds of life you can see in this river. And then we debrief that at the end of the day, relating it back to land use and back to personal action. Oh, it's, it's um, just kind of a tour, you know? So a little bit less education about watershed. It really depends on the group. Um, but typically it's, let's go see what's in the river and all this amazing life that's here. Um, I have a question a little bit less about what you do with groups and more about um, if you're out there snorkeling kind of by yourself, what is the like, permission process? Like, do you need any permits? No. Are you doing any of this? No, it really depends on where you are. Um, so, um, you know, obviously if the, if the water's posted as no swimming, I try to stay out of that because I don't want to cause a, a, a problem. Um, but, you know, the Pennsylvania State Parks has a rule you're not supposed to swim in rivers. And I do, a lot. 
And, and the secretary of the DNR in Pennsylvania knows that I do because I just talked to her like six months ago about the, whoops, about the idea of snorkeling rivers. And so um, I really try to do things above board and check in with the, the park manager and let them know that I'm going to be there and going to be snorkeling. And I hope you're okay with that. And most managers are, are like, yeah, that's fine. And some are like, no, you can't do that. Um, so I've never run into a problem. The only problem I've run into is 911 calls. Um, and that, you know, kind of restores my faith in humanity. They see most people check on you before they call 911, so that's a good thing. Um, I, that happened, in, I was in the middle of, of uh, Piscan National Forest out in the middle of nowhere, and I hear this crashing through the leaves, and I thought it was a bear coming to check me out, and it was a hiker who thought I was dead. So even in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, there's no set permissions or anything like that or permits, but again, it really depends on, on where you are. State lands, you always want to make sure that you're checking out what those rules are. National lands are wide open. Um, Delaware Water Gap, they really don't want you in the water snorkeling. I guess they've had a lot of drownings there, but um, Park Service, most of the Park Service folks know that we snorkel up there and they're okay with it, so. Anything else? Thanks for coming.